Awesome. Hi, Marcus. How are you tonight? Hi, I'm cool. Well, great event. Thank you for inviting me in tonight's seminar and Taoist Access. Wonderful session, isn't it? Yeah, uh, we're, it's great to have you here. So everyone who's familiar with Endowist Access, you know, we invite people onto our weekly webinar um, to talk about very important financial planning topics. Property, of course, is an extremely important topic. And we have a very special guest tonight, an expert in the field, Marcus, who is the Singapore CEO of ERA, one of the biggest property agents here in Singapore. Welcome, Marcus. Hey, thank you, Gregory. Thank you so much. So um, wonderful meet week. Yes, a great way to spend uh, instead of eating dinner on Wednesday night. Exactly. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us. If you want to ask questions, please go to Slido. Um, that's sli.do and join as a join as a participant by entering the code 436354. And we'll try to address the questions as we go. And at the end of the presentation, we'll be fed questions uh, during the presentation. So feel free to go ahead and ask there. You can upvote questions um, that you think are most important as well. Really, uh, you know, just in the, at the end of last year, in Dallas and ERA signed a collaboration to share expertise in enriching the financial well-being of our consumer bases. Um, which is really everyone here in Singapore. I mean, property is such an essential part of your wealth that endow us as a wealth platform cannot neglect property from that conversation. So this is a really important uh, way for us to really, you know, I think first and foremost, educate our users so that you can make the most informed decisions possible. Uh, for those of you who don't know endow us, we help people invest better to live easier today and be better prepared and live better tomorrow. Certainly, you know, your living situation, the way you live property is a very important part of that equation. Not only, you know, as you are getting towards retirement, but also through the retirement years. I think most of us are not preparing enough for that. Um, and there's a lot we can actually do now today in order to prepare for those later years. And that was Asia's leading fee only wealth platform fee only very briefly means that we can only be paid by our client, which, which keeps us independent. We cannot be paid kickbacks, which is the way a lot of the financial services industry makes money. So a lot of the financial services industry, yes, they make money from you, but they also make money from the product provider without you knowing how much money they're making. And this leads to all sorts of misaligned incentives, which we really don't like. Um, we've been in existence for a number of years now. We are probably the biggest fee-only wealth platform now in, in, in Asia um, with a number of backers, including EDBI, uh, Samsung, Singtel, uh, UBS, the largest wealth manager in the world, SoftBank, Lightspeed, and more. We are, again, licensed by MAS and the first digital advisor for all your money, cash, CPF, and SRS. Our clients choose us for three reasons. Um, the advice we give, the access to products. So we give exclusive access to a lot of the products on the platform, leveraging some of the leading and largest, uh, sorry, largest institutional fund managers in the world and cost. We have no sales charges, no transaction fees, no fees that would make us want to do anything that would be against you. Uh, we've also innovated the 100% trailer free rebate. So anything that we do get paid from anyone but you, we give back to you in full. Uh, we've rebated over a million dollars to our clients today. Finally, we have a deep partnership with UOBK Yen, uh, one of the largest brokers here in Singapore, and have a double ledger of security of your assets. I mean, Endowas is a relatively new player, and we think this is an extremely important point where when you create an Endowas account, we create an account for you at UOBKN in your own name. Um, this means that all your assets, your transactions are passing through that specific UOBKN account. Typically, uh, a lot of platforms just have a single ledger, so only they know you exist. When you use Endowus, Endowus and UOBKN, both licensed by MAS, 
know that you exist as a client and know what your assets are. Our goal is to really build the next generational digital wealth experience. And we've brought together over a hundred people now in Singapore with financial and technology expertise to make this happen. Um, as a result, Endowis is the first digital advisor for all your money, private wealth, cash, and public pensions. Today, serving well over 30,000 individuals and advising over one and a half billion dollars of their wealth. Um, and this has really been achieved over the last two years and, you know, great partners uh, to make it happen. Uh, Joanne Pei is our most recent brand ambassador. You may have seen some of the ads around town. To really kick off this relationship with ERA and to everyone listening to the webinar tonight, uh, you are go you can, if you sign up for an account today using this QR code, you can get $28 off your access fees. This is a limited time offer. Um, this is equivalent to over 10, so to 10,000 advice free for eight months. So please go ahead and scan that QR code, get started on your journey. It's completely free to start an account. And, um, and we look forward to helping you on your wealth journey. So now I'm going to pass it over to Marcus. Um, to introduce ERA. Yeah. Hi, uh, everyone. Good evening to you. I am one of your 30,000 individual investor. Thank you, Marcus. And, and also contributing to your 1.5 billions of your wealth. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very important point. Thank you, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> so I support endowers. <laughs> okay. Uh, something about ERA. Uh, well, I am the CEO of ERA Singapore and also in Asia Pacific. And it is my pleasure this evening with, uh, together with Gregory Vent, uh, to share about the property outlook 2022 savings for your property and life goals. So before that, let me talk a little bit about ERA. This is our office building situated at Topayo, at the heart of Topayo, where HDB Hub is. We're next to HDB Hub building and we own this building and the only real estate listed agency that owns a building. So the building name is called ERA APEC Center. ERA APEC Center, okay. All right, uh, something about ERA is uh, we are the wholly owned subsidiaries of um, the parent company known as APEC Realty. And APEC Realty, uh, it's uh, into three um, businesses, which is from uh, the real estate brokerage service, and uh, that is derived commission space fees via digital and market property uh, brokerage services, transactions on multiple platforms, such as the project sales, which is we call primary market sales, and the resale market, we call secondary sales, uh, rental of residential, commercial, and industrial property, auctions for financial institutions, and also property owner. And recently, we have just set out our capital market and investment sales department for high net worth individual family office, developers, institutional investors, and also REITs. Um, we are also in that franchise business. We are all over in Asia Pacific. In fact, uh, we own the Asia Pacific franchise rights in 17 countries. Right now, we have 10 uh, franchisees in um, 10 countries, and we are the uh, owners of four countries which are our subsidiaries as well. They are places like Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, mm, Thailand, and Malaysia. Okay, we also have the other business arm, which is RIA Real Estates, uh, which is doing all the training programs for real estate agents, and also our valuation team and property management team. All right, so much about our uh, company. Okay. Shall I begin about the property market for 2022, which is the agenda for this evening? Yeah, for sure. I think people are really interested in, you know, the recent cooling measures and, and what that means for them. So Marcus, this is a very important session. Okay. So what's the property outlook for 2022? I think all the guests here want to know whether property price would drop after all the cooling measures. Am I right to say that? What do you think, Gregory? Will the price be on the upside or coming down? Well, it just depends on supply and demand like every other market. All right. Let's take a look what happens in the past, don't we? 
So in the past, there is also cooling measure. And this is not the first time that our dear government has introduced cooling measure, isn't it? Okay, so, well, in the past, we if we take a look at it, uh, there is cooling measure uh, that is introduced recently. And that is, uh, that is on the 16th of December. And, and uh, previously, there is also the cooling measure introduced much early on in 2013, which is like the TDSR APSD cooling measure. And besides cooling measure, there is also other crises, right? Such as the global financial crisis, the SARS, the dot-com burst, and the Asia financial crisis, and also the world economic crisis, much earlier in the in the in the last in this century. So, if we take a look at this chart, it shows the property price index. This is the property uh, private property price index. All right, and uh, the. If you are looking forward for property price drop, okay, if you can take a look at it, these are all the percentage of drop all the way from earlier days in the 80s and the most recent cooling measure that was introduced in uh, 2018. Okay, uh, in the past, it has dropped as much minus 35% or minus 44% as for the Asia financial crisis and the global financial crisis like minus 23%, right? But most recently, the most drastic uh, TDS, RO, ABSD introduced in 21.3, the drop is like minus 11%. And 2018, the drop is like 0.7%, okay? But if we take a look at uh, the rise of the property market, it's like much more, isn't it? So every time when there's a drop, Okay, such as um, if you take a look at the very beginning, like minus 35%, the rise is like plus 442%. So that is more than 10 times, isn't it? So during Asia financial crisis, even it dropped 44%, it also rebounded back 40%. Okay, during SARS and dot-com, it dropped 18%. It rebounded back 57.8%. And global financial crisis dropped 23%. It rebounded 62%. So every time there's a drop, there is a return, a recovery, and that is even stronger. So the high is never the high or that previous low uh, possibly can never be go back to that level again. Okay? So the previous low is actually cannot be cannot be realized again for the new low. Okay, but if we take a look at the duration of the rise uh, of the property market, it's actually much longer than the drop. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is that right now we are at this position of December 16, 2021 cooling measure. So what's going to happen to the property market? Okay, I would, would want to put everyone's attention is that the Singapore property market actually experienced quite a lot of... Uh, gains and also uh, quite a lot of loss as per seen by the earlier chart. But uh, what we can derive from there is that the percentage gain is certainly more than the percentage loss. And therefore, it has created a trend. And that is an uptrend, isn't it? So for all the investor community here or potential home buyers here or even upgraders here, all right, if you are looking into an investment vehicle, obviously you want to be part of that uptrend investment vehicle, which is, in this case, Singapore property market. So Singapore property market has moved from point A to point B. And from point A to point B is actually like three times, from January 2003 all the way to now January 2012. Uh, property market per square foot price have actually increased from $600 to as high as $1,008, all right? This is the overall property market uh, PSF average price. So can you see that there is an uptrend that is going on? And will this uptrend continue, all right? That is the very important question. Uh, if it has been an uptrend, there's always resistance that resists that uptrend. And there's always support that uh, prevent the, the market from crashing all the way down. Okay, and property is a real asset. I mean, you cannot zero-lize property price unless the lease run out. Other than that, is, uh, there is always a support level okay, that will uh, cap the fall and uh, the market will recover. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is that let's take a look at what is the resistance right now and the support right now that is presented in today's market situation. Okay, already. Can you all tell me what is the resistance right now for price rise in property market? What do you think, Gabriel? 
uh, cooling measures? Absolutely. Bravo. <laughs> Bravo, thank bravo. You, you. This is what yeah. the government wants to hear. They want to cool the price. So they are not going to kill the price. They just want to cool the price, which is like slow down the rate of growth. So that is uh, why cooling measures introduced. So slow down the rate of growth so that's resistant. And the top of the town is this, isn't it? There's like the higher interest rate. Okay, so the uh, central bank Fed interest rate is going to increase. Uh, this year, 2022, what do as many as how many times? probably three or four times, okay? So there is already increased mortgage rates that is uh, introduced by the banks, okay? Uh, the bank's in, uh, interest rate has slowly creeping up right now. If you guys have just taken up loans uh, or probably refinance your property, okay, you probably notice that a few months ago, if you asked about the bank interest rate, it actually creeped up uh, a little bit, okay? But um, this year, 2022, it is expected that interest rate will continue to creep up. Okay, next is the other resistance is the government support plan for mortgagee, all right, which means if you got difficulty paying your monthly uh, mortgage repayment, uh, used to have that support plan from the government, right? It's called the COVID-19 support plan. Do you remember that, uh, Gregory? Indeed, yes, yes, that's right. Oh, so that prevent mortgagee sales, isn't it? So actually, last year, our mortgagee sale isn't a lot because part of the reason is this, okay, government support plan for mortgagee. But do you know that this year, this will cease? Okay, so if this will cease, uh, therefore, it is also present as a resistance, right? Because if there's more hot, um, what do you call, for sales, right? Bank sales, then it poses as a resistance for price rise because price will drop. Okay, so that you are. These are the three main things that pose as resistant. Well, if you take a look at the support, uh, I have a whole list of it that I want to share with you. Okay, number one is Singapore is still undergoing a very robust employment and ongoing economic growth. Wouldn't you agree? Okay, I think uh, this is uh, very positive and we are in the phase of recovery. Okay, even with the Omicron, uh, there is um, something that is to watch out for. But at the same time, I think our government has done a fantastic job in uh, getting that vaccination. And do you know that if you are not fully vaccinated, you cannot come to office. Huh? You, you cannot be working even as a real estate salesperson. <laughs> How about your site, uh, Gregory? No, it's definitely, yeah, I mean, the rules are much stricter now. So, so absolutely. you guys cannot go back to office too? Huh? Well, for the vaccinated, we can. And we're, we're high percentage vaccinated. But yes, that's right. Okay, next is the lower supply that is currently um, faced in the new homes uh, market. You know, project launches, okay, uh, that is currently depleting unsold, uncompleted new home units. Okay, which means the, the properties that is already launched that is unsold is getting lesser and lesser. Okay, and despite cooling measure, uh, that is introduced on the 16th December, we still see um, projects that is uh, flying off the shelf, okay, that is bought by genuine buyers. Okay, that also presents support. That means there is, there is lower supply now, which means there's no hurry for developer to sell. So they can still maintain at the kind of price that they are marketing. Okay, next is rising inflation. Uh, what I'm talking about is increasing construction and also labor costs. Now, increasing construction labor costs has something to do with the property price uh, benchmark. Okay, why is it so? It's because any new land that is purchased by developer, okay, uh, developer will have to do construction, right? And then market it and sell it to the public. So if the construction cost is going to increase, so developer will have to factor that increase in construction cost into the future selling price. So if future selling price is supported by uh, increasing construction costs, then which means um, the price is very well supported, isn't it? Well, there is actually four components of pricing um, the, the new launch uh, projects. Okay, number one is the land cost. Looks like land cost is not dropping. And uh, any of the government land sales that is uh, on sales or even recently sold, uh, the, the land cost itself, it has... Uh, reach its record level and uh, in fact anyone any developer who wants to buy new land they have to up their 
They have to up their game and they have to bid at higher price. If they don't bid at higher price, they cannot get the site because other developer will take it. So can you imagine if you keep on bidding for sites, you cannot, cannot get the site, then you're out of business because you have development. If you're not buying any land, then you won't be have you won't have anything to develop, right? So you have to buy land. And you have to buy land, you must buy higher price land. And if the late uh, second component is construction cost, so you're gonna pay higher construction costs, you're gonna factor that in, but you gotta add in more facilities and, and uh, uh good things in that development. So the facilities in the development has to be something new, something uh, different, and something that the consumer would love to have. Okay, then the third is marketing fee. So marketing fees to housing agents and also application fees for uh, the approvers from the authorities and also the increase in development charges. These are all uh, costs that the developer have to pay, okay, which is also rising. And the last part is the developer margin, okay, though it's squeezed, developer also want to make a good margin. So I would say that all these is a factor of very strong support, okay, for the private property price, okay, despite uh, cooling measures. So you will see a, a knee-jerk reaction in the market in terms of uh, demand, uh, but however, the price will not drop in a sense, okay, being supported by uh, the rising inflation. Next is also not many projects facing that five-year deadline. You know, there's a five-year ABSD deadline, okay? Every uh, developer knows that they have to sell all their units within five years of, uh, of their sales, okay? Which means if they can't, if, even if they left one unit, okay, they are still subjected to their ABSD deadline. So in 2022, this year, the number of units that is like facing the five-year ABSD deadline is only left with about 120 units. So it's not a lot in the market that is facing five-year deadline. Okay, next is also undersupply of HDB BTO flats. Okay, having said that, we know that the government is beefing up in supplying BTO flats uh, to the public, okay, to uh, to apply, okay, especially the first timer, the newlyweds. Okay, however, having said that, is that uh, the newlyweds numbers is uh, as high as um, 20, let me see, it's about, 23,000 in a year, okay? Whereas the supply since uh, 2015 to 2019, it is grossly undersupplied, uh, averaging 16,200 BTO flats that is put up to the market. Only recent um, um, launch is like 2022 all the way to 2023. The next two years is 23,000 per year supply. So it's just doing a catch up on that uh, supply of BTO flats. Next is there's a strong demand for newly wet and HDB upgraders. So, all, you know, government increased supply of BTO flat because there's a very strong demand of newly wet and also HDB upgraders. Okay. Then next is uh, switching demand to HDB resale flat. Okay. Because of the, uh, of that disappointment of not getting your BTO flats uh, because of the oversubscription, um, the first timers are also switching in uh, the resale market, okay? And talking about resale market, this year, 2022, is actually a record year for the HDB MOP flats, all right? Do you know that there is actually 35,000 HDB MOP flats? That means flats that is ready to put up to the resale market. And this will, part of this will be converted into transactions uh, this year, okay? So um, these are all, the uh, outlook of that property market being uh, explained in that resistance and also in that uh, um, support. So we have more support and lesser resistance. So what do you think? Are we still in the uptrend? Again, it all comes down to supply and demand. And I think that it's safe to say that demand for property in Singapore is not going to suddenly disappear. Oh yes, definitely. I think it's the aspiration yeah. of every Singaporeans to own their own property, right? Right. And to upgrade and, 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 you know, for even for foreigners to buy property here in Singapore, but you know, can, will it be subject to fluctuations? It absolutely can. Right. Um, but you need to take certainly a longer term view on the home you live in. 
Right, right, right. Certainly. So I, yeah, as long as the demand is not going to suddenly disappear and the supply, which is quite well monitored by the government, doesn't suddenly explode. So we don't suddenly have a huge surplus. It's, right. That's right. I, I think the market is is healthy. Yeah. Okay. I think the government has uh, done a great job. They are always trying to balance this on the supply and demand. But there's always this uh um there's this, always this lead and lack effect. All right. It's just like now we are in the depleting supply situations for new launches. That is the new home sales. As we as the as the volume deplete, we'll come to a point is like uh under supply. So for yeah. that, uh, the demands is very strong. So this will give support to that price. Okay. And yeah. even it may even rise price in raise price is, is instead of drop price uh, by the developer. So the thing is, uh, in a situation like uh, when there's too much land sales or when there's too much on block sales, uh, then there's too many units in the market. Okay. So that's the time when there's more challenge uh, to the property market. Okay. So that is where. Uh, it's like um, the lack actually followed by the lead. So it's like, oh, it's time to clear stock now. So we got to stop buying and start selling all uh, the units that is in the market. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I discovered that there is the slides that is uh, early on that I say, what is the new property cooling measure in this, this part of the presentation? So shall I talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think running through that quickly would be helpful. Thank you, <laughs> so, so the, the slides actually went from the bottoms up. Uh. Okay, let me talk about the new property cooling measure. I think all of us saw this uh, like in everywhere, right? in social media and in, uh, in the main media. Okay, actually this is from the Ministry of National Development, MND. Okay, that shows this uh, colorful table and chart here. Uh, number one, two, and three. So these are the three main uh, cooling measures that was introduced 16 December 2021. Number one is the higher ABST rates. And that's for Singaporean and also PRF buying their second or more property. So um, government is trying to discourage uh, purchase for two or more properties. But if you have the money, go ahead. You have to pay additional ABST. All right. Um, so for foreigners and entities buying home in Singapore, uh, we have to pay ABST. And for developer buying any land in Singapore, there's also increase in uh, ABST rates. So the second cooling measure is the TDSR threshold has lowered. All right. That is from the previous 60% to 55%. And there are some implications on this, which I'll explain to you shortly. And LTV for HDB loans have also reduced. Okay. Um, that is the loan to value for HDB loans. Now, if you're buying HDBs, there is uh, an option to participate, ap apply for that HDB loans, or you can apply for bank loan. But for HDB loan, the LV LTV has actually dropped from 90% to 85%. So what is the effect here is that cooling measure will not affect first-timer. Okay, that's for sure. Cooling measure will not affect first-timer. Next is... Um, Majority of the private property transactions actually do not involve ABSD. Can you believe it? Okay, just take a look at this, oh, this wow. chart that's, here. That's very surprising. That, yeah, surprise. I mean, to, mm -hmm. to us, we are watching the market. We want to find out who actually pay ABSD and how many percent of that um, purchasers are playing ABSD. If you look at year 2020, which is the latest figure from data.gov, is 18.8% proportion of stamp duty that is, uh, that is buyer's stamp duty that is excess, so it's 18.8. 81.2% pays buyer stamp duty, which is the first timer. And the uh, multiple purchase buyer, you have to pay the stamp duty also. But if you are the second and more property purchaser, you have to pay the APSD. If you compare that to 2018, that was 24%. Right now, it's 18.8%. What this means is that there's actually lesser people paying ABST. Do you see that? Okay. Yeah, no, that the trend is surprising. It's surprising. Right. But From actually... 24% uh, to 19% is a big jump down. Well, if you, if you look at the asset value in 2020 and 2018 for property price, you probably know that 2020, the price have actually increased, right? So if you're talking about ABST, that has also increased, 
it should be even higher than 18.8%, which means actually the actual number of people that is paying ABSD is, 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 is probably dropped even more than this, what you've seen here. This is on the uh, proportion of stamp duties. But uh, we don't okay. know how so many people dollar, actually this pay. This is dollar ABSD. value rather Correct. than... Correct, this dollar value. Uh, okay, so, not the number of people paying. Actually, the number of people is even lower. So it's like mm -hmm. lesser people pay ABSD. So the people that is affected involving ABSD is lesser and the majority is not affected by this rule which is mm -hmm. APSD. so we have found uh i mean there are ways that uh, people are structuring deals okay that is like uh, individual names to buy one property instead of joint names so you have two names your husband and wife the husband buy a property the wife buy a property so it's two property right but you don't have to pay ABSD because each one own one property so this is like the norm now that is in the market so when there's a policy change like this, the way the deals are structured have also changed. So, and this shows that majority of the private property transactions do not involve APSD. And in fact, most of the property purchase now is younger generations that is buying. Those with the ICs that um, that starts with nine, uh, nine zero. So it's like 1990s and those who are born 1990s and beyond uh, coming into the market. So they are like in their early, early 20s that is buying property. Don't ask me where they get their down payment from. Okay, uh, I think it's from their parents. Otherwise, it's probably from profit make from endowers uh, that, that has uh, presented them with the cash down payment. All right. So next is the maximum loan uh, has also re uh, lowered because of that TDSR threshold that has fallen from 60% to 55%. So what this means is that the maximum loan amount have actually reduced, okay, by actually not 5%, but 8%, because 5% of 60% is 8%, okay? So your maximum purchase price used to be like 1.78 million based on your income and also your age or your uh, average weighted age of uh, husband and wife. So the purchase price right now is uh, lower to 1.63, which is down to 3, uh, 8%, which means by, uh, if you want to max out, then the maximum purchase price is slightly lower, lower by about 8%. Okay, next is the HDB loans. Okay, give me a minute. HDB loans is the lower LTV for HDB loans for 500,000 flat, for example. Buyer need to pay an extra 25,000 in cash or CPF. Okay, for HDB granted loan. So there's two types of loan. Huh? So it's a bank loan and HDB loan. So this one is extra $25,000 cash. Okay, so what these new property cooling measures, and I've just explained to you, and why this new cooling measure, okay, I think there's always this talk, uh, this script that the government talk about, which is property market shall not run ahead of economic fundamentals. So DPM Heng talk about this in Radar 61 anniversary celebration in January 18, 2021 last year. And do you know who else talked about this? Uh, Finance Minister talked about this. Okay. MND Minister talked about this. Okay. So Minister Lawrence, Minister Desmond all talked about this. Property fundamentals shall not run ahead of economic fundamentals. So what do you mean by economic fundamentals? So we take a look at it. What is property price? Economic fundamentals is like our GDP growth and also our employment rates. Okay, so if you take a look at 2021, look at that property price growth is 10.6%. Okay, so that is the prior property price growth, 10.6%. What about 2021 GDP growth? 5.9%. Okay, employment rate, 2.7%. So what this means is like, is, is, does it mean that the property price growth is ahead of economic fundamental? Looks like it is, right? Then we take a look at this. This is the uh, price growth versus right uh, income growth. So income growth is uh, if if the medium income of um, Singaporean is uh, rising uh, beyond that property price rise, then which means affordability is there which means it's not overstretching okay but in this case even uh look at the recent years like 2017 all the way to 2020 okay the private properties price growth have actually supersede all right the medium household income growth 
So the faster pace of uh, property price growth compared to the median income growth in recent year, okay, definitely have, um, have put the property market in the radar of cooling measure. And that's why anytime uh, it was introduced, like 2018, it was introduced. And then 2020 uh, was also introduced. Okay. So the implications of the new cooling measure, okay, uh, there are three that I would like to explain. Number one is uh, there is likely to have a knee-jerk reaction, okay, which is uh, a short period, okay? Why do I say short period? If you take a look at 2018 uh, cooling measure, that was the previous uh, cooling measure that was introduced before the 20. 21 December 16 cooling measure. Okay, that um, cooling measure have uh, caused about 0.7% drop, okay, in terms of the property price index over two quarters. Then for the next, um, next uh, three years, from 2019 first quarter all the way to fourth quarter 2021, the property price index actually climbed 16.8%. So that means there is uh knee-jerk reaction for a short period and then strong recovery on home price for a long period and as i said the abst actually is not affecting a lot of people majority more than 80 percent of the uh, buyers are not affected by abst so as long as you can fulfill that tdsr requirement you still can make that purchase without effect without being affected by the cooling measure but back then in 2013 the case uh, the scenario is a bit different because 2013, I would say that that time it comes as a shock to the market. Right now, it's not really a shock. Right now, it's like making adjustment. Back then in 2013, it's actually to the shock to the market because you never see what is TDSR. It's trying to try to trying to trying to understand what is TDSR. And right now, it's 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 a common lingo for all the um the, the consumer and also the agents and the uh, and the bankers and. And it's so common. I mean, back then in 2013, it's a shock. So when it's a shock, the duration of the knee-jerk reaction is longer. Right now, it's actually shorter. Okay, I have to speed up. Huh? Second, more people may sell their property first before upgrading because more cash is needed. Okay, so if you're buying second property, you need to pay more ABSD. Therefore, you have to... Uh, probably sell first then in order to buy. But in the past, before this uh, December cooling measure is uh, those who can, uh, who can still afford to pay the ABSD first, they can get a remission of ABSD after they have sell their property within six months of buying. Okay, the third thing that we foresee is that the rental demands will remain strong. Okay, because more people will sell their uh, home first and uh, because of the delay in construction and, and uh, delivery of the properties, and more VTL foreign demands coming, I think uh, the rental demand will be strong. Okay. I have um, explained to you the cooling measure and also why and its effect. Shall I continue uh, or shall I stop here for a while, uh, Gabriel? There's one question from the audience that I would like you to address. Okay, and, sure. And we can talk about. So if you take a longer term view and you had a couple of slides with the price index, uh, the Singapore price index. If you take a longer term view, is there ever a situation where it makes more sense to rent than buy property in Singapore? Yeah, uh, firstly, uh, thank you for that question. Um, you know, APEC Realty is, it's a majority owned by a private equity group called North Star, right? North Star Private Equity. So uh, before the COVID-19, I attended a lot of uh, seminars that is in Jakarta and um, meeting up with fund managers also. And they are in the view that they will never buy property. <laughs> they are in the view that property is a lousy investment. Uh, they rather rent. So whoever that is asking this question, it depends on who you are and who is asking this question. Okay, seriously, uh, if you are someone that never believe in property investment, Tonight, whatever I talk, you will never invest in real estate. Okay, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, against anyone that is not investing in real estate, but that is the choice that uh, anyone can choose. You can always invest in uh, a vehicle that is like Endowers. So Endowers uh, provides a platform that can help you to make more, probably make more uh, returns 
Okay, so if the returns from the property market is not as strong as the return as what you expect, because the returns in the property market over the many years, okay, it's like averaging um, three, three to five percent, okay, over the many years. So if you're someone that expect it to be much more, and if you are lo not looking at long-term investments, then probably property investment is not for you and you should rent a property. Okay, so in my point of view, it's depending on who you are. Uh, but for those who desire ownership, okay, like the, whoever bought property is because you want to own something in Singapore. So for that ownership desire, you regardless of whether the property is uh, it's a good returns or no returns or, or, or no good returns, you will still go ahead with the purchase, isn't it? So yeah, I would I mean, say I it think... depends on who you are. Mm, yeah, so I think yields in Asian cities tend to be lower than in other places in the world. We know that for sure, right? But interest so, rate in Singapore is also very low because in the other part of the cities in the world, the interest rate could be much higher. Okay, but but interest rate aside, there is a there is sort of a behavioral tendency, right? There's a behavioral tendency absolutely, for, absolutely, for people, well said to want to own homes. And that is what creates the demand. And, and there's and, social media that is uh, widespread and uh, there, are, there are investors or there are buyers who say they buy a property as young as 21 years old or you know, 26 years old mm -hmm. own a condominium. So yeah. that kind of message that is out is also uh, influenced the mindset and also the behavior of the consumer. But pure, okay, exactly. So purely from a historical perspective, so they say over like, you know, a 30 year period, it doesn't make sense to rent uh, versus buy. I think historically looking at Singapore, it would not have made sense to rent versus buy because you would have missed out on a lot of capital appreciation. Now, will that capital appreciation always be there? Um, you know, no one knows, um, but we know that it's a well-supported market. Right, uh, right. But then there is the desire to own a property and just like every asset, right, the market, so the, the supply and demand dynamic has priced the yield to be very, very low in a lot of the major Asian cities, including Singapore. And that is just where the market has placed it. Um, and right. it's given you some capital appreciation. It's not a huge amount of capital appreciation, but some capital appreciation for owning property in Singapore. Yeah, it's not a straight line. Uh, so early on, I show you there's resistance and there's support. So uh, mm -hmm. from point A to point B is never a straight line, but we know property is in the uptrend. I mean, can anyone tell me that in Singapore, are we in the downtrend or in the uptrend? So if it's in the uptrend, so it's always wiser to be a landlord than a tenant, especially over the last few years. Okay, you don't know that during COVID, uh, when COVID strikes, there is actually uh, a demand, a very strong demand on rental property. Yeah, and... people were changing to bigger rental properties. <laughs> yeah. Last night I was having dinner, I overheard uh, from another table on a, a young couple. They are talking about renting property. They always want that freedom of staying on their own. And they are like in their early 20s. So they're discussing where to rent and uh, what kind of property mm -hmm. to rent. And you know, the mindset of, uh, uh, of uh, the younger generation is that they want to stay on their own. So renter during COVID-19 actually has very strong demand, okay? And that also um, a give joy to landlord, isn't it? Yeah. And rents have actually increased. Yeah, I mean, commensurate with the property price increases as well. Yeah, I have just uh, renewed a rent for my uh, tenant uh, for a one bedroom unit that I used to rent out for, uh, let me see, 1850. Now I'm collecting $2,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, a, it's, it's, it's like proportional to property's price growth in 2021, which is about 10%. Okay. Marcus, I'm going to force you to speed through the next okay. topic sure. and you have to skip slides. Okay. You can flash sure. them, but you have how to long more them. do I have? Uh... <laughs> I'll give you, I'll give you uh, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Okay. okay. Bring it on, man. 
Okay. So you gotta, let you me gotta run quickly. Okay. Let me. Okay. Okay. Let me talk about the PLH because part of the agenda we want to talk about what is the impact of the prime location public housing. Okay. Prime location public housing, as the name implies, is prime location. So it's like the hot place, hot property. But I put a question mark there. Is it really hot property? I know it's oversubscribed by as much as nine times. Okay, one person bought that unit four room flat in the central location where I just I just a circle here. Nine person didn't get it, so it's nine times oversubscribed. Okay, if you look at other BPO locations besides the central locations like the Rocho Ophia area, there's also Aukang, Jurong West, Tunga, which is a new town. Okay, all this is also oversubscribed, but not as much as nine times. Okay, now if you look at the PLH, that is actually indeed limited supply. All right, out of the 4,500 BTO flats that was introduced, 21% 960 is the PLH flat during the last exercise. So PLH have stringent uh, conditions. Okay, so if you, are, if you are subscribing for PLH, prime location public housing, the MOP is extended to 10 years. It's not that five year for BTO flats. So for that, you have long waiting time. That means if you subscribe for Rocio PLH flats, for example, congratulations, you have got your choice location, uh, Rocio flats, but your holding period is as long as 16 years. So it's six year construction. Right now it's about six year construction because of the COVID-19 um, delay and 10 years MOP. So if you are 30 years old right now, applying for that PLH flats, 46 years old is the year that you can resell that flats in the market. Okay, so it's long waiting time. And from PLH and BTO, the current situation that we observe in the market is that the buyers is actually switching this demand into resale flats. Okay, I'll give you an example. Like my staff who recently got married, she cannot wait already. She has to buy a resale flat instead of uh, keep on uh, going for BTO and cannot get anything. Okay, um, next is let's talk about the subsidiary recovery. Now for PLH, the resale proceeds. So in the future, 16 years later, if you were to sell the PLH that you got, you have to pay back subsidiary recovery. For the Rocho BPO flats, it's at 6%. So the future um, PLH, it depends. So for Rocho, it's 6%. Future other locations may be even higher or maybe lower. So right now, we're talking about 6%. We're so can 6%, you make... 6% of your selling price or your purchase price? 6% of your selling price. Okay. Okay. Got it. So it's like... Uh, so if you're selling, if you if you're selling it's at like a, much a higher seller price, stamp duty, yeah. <laughs> okay. So it's, it's not it's seller stamp duty; like it's called like... subsidiary recovery. Hey, because right. seriously, all the flats is it's a uh, price very attractive, and it comes from taxpayer money, isn't it? So it's okay. subsidiary. Okay, so it's only for Singaporean for this uh, okay. this very wonderful product that is uh, invented by HDB. Okay, so can you make money or not? So seriously, PLH, can you make money or not? The objective of a government is actually to have an inclusive society. Not so much on making money, but I want to prove it to you whether I can make money or not. So this evening, uh, I'm glad to be here to show you something, okay, which is HDB resale proceeds comparison in the future if you buy a BTO and there's a non-prime location versus one that is in the prime location called PLH. Okay, in this example, the purchase price for Rocho BTO PLH is 688,000. And this is the real price uh, that is presented in that uh, uh, in that applications. Okay, so for non-prime BTO four-room flats on my right is Aukang. Okay, it's 377,000. So um, what happened in the future if you were to sell this? So we tabulate here to sell an MOP. So if you have a PLH, you have to sell, you know, 10 years later, that is 10 years MOP. And for a non-prime BTO, you have to sell five years. You can sell five years later. Okay. What this price that I put there, 998,200, uh, is based on the estimated 2021 average price of similar four-room resale flat in the central region. Okay, in the central region. That means central, it can be like the pinnacles at Duxton. Okay, that means that kind of flats. The kind of four-room flats is going at this kind of price. So uh, what about that non-prime? That non-prime like Aukang is selling like 557000 for MOP five-year flats. So if we take this as a comparison, 
the case study of PLH versus non-prime BTO, okay, is this. We have the BTO price, okay, for both. We have the interest rate of 2.6%, assuming you're taking the uh, HDB interest rate. Hey, why you go back? Let me see. Okay, you got a holding period of five years and 10 years. So you have the estimated paid together with the interest. So that is your actual cost of buying that property. So you have the gross selling price and you have the subsidy from HDB. There's a crawback of 6%, right? So your net selling price for that PLH is not 998K, it's 938K. So that makes a difference, okay? Versus that 500 over 1,000, your sales proceeds, if you take the net selling price minus away the estimated uh, total cost of uh, holding at the end of the 10 years and the five year, looks like the profit that is from that resale flat in the norm prams looks more attractive. If you are seriously talking about profit, Okay, but seriously, I think the the HDB movement is not so much about profit. It's more about inclusive, all right, <laughs> to have HDB flats in prime locations. Okay, so if you're a person looking for uh, living in that prime location, go for it. But if you're a person looking at profit, I'm not sure. Next is PLH income ceiling is capped at 14,000 per month. Okay, applies to present and future buyers. So would that put a cap in the upside for future selling price okay in fact uh i would want to address this because indeed the maximum loan amount will be capped for resale plh okay uh with a maximum income ceiling of fourteen thousand. because right now if you buy a new b uh plh which is uh if you go and subscribe you 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 will, if you are earning anything that is more than fourteen thousand income you cannot apply it must be fourteen thousand or below Okay, so if it's at 14,000, what will be that maximum uh, loan that we're talking about? It will be depending on that 30% MSR for HDB flats and also the age of the borrower. So the age of the borrower will be also the income weighted average age for borrower that is taking up bank loans. And average age of borrower for, for taking that HDB loan. So I have two columns, plan D and plan E, because this this uh, financial plan is taken from our in-house uh, apps known as the robo advisor that you can get the robo advisor application by downloading an app called realty watch and realty watch is created by era okay you got lots of application there you're able to monitor your neighborhood transactions prices and get notifications all right the most important is you can have our robo advisor to do your financial calculation and over here uh, in that option D and option E, option D is you are buying that uh, HDB flats using bank loan. Uh, the maximum loan is 838K, all right? If you use HDB loan, it's also 838K. But then because of the LTV, if you're taking bank loan, the LTV is 75%. If you are taking HDB loan, it has reduced from 90 to 85%, which means that is the highest property price you can afford, okay, for maximum usage of CPF. So uh, the highest property price that you can afford for using bank loan is 1.117 million. And the highest um, property price that you can purchase for using HDB loans is 985K. So what do this mean? Anything that's above this value here, okay, whether you're taking HDB loan or, or this uh, bank loan, if you are the future buyer of that PLH flat, let me tell you, anything above this, you have to pay by cash. Okay, so anything above this, you must pay by cash, which means you need to have a lot of cash. And if you are having an income ceiling of 14,000, how can you have a lot of cash uh, savings if you are someone that is earning 14K? So yeah, you, you probably have from the support of your <laughs> probably parents. Otherwise, is there will always be a limitation on how much your future buyer can afford. Okay, so there is this, there's this uh, thing that probably most do not realize that the 14,000 income cap also applies to the future buyer of your PLH flat. And that will have a lower chance of high cash proceeds. So the real consideration for PLH, I would say number one, limited supply, limited chance for you to get. Nine times oversubscribe is like low three effect. Number two, there's a long waiting time. It's 16 years before you can sell. Number three, there's a lower chance of high cash proceeds. But having said all this, okay, I'm, I'm, I don't want to sound so negative. Go ahead with your PLH because 
you love that location, you love that environment and uh, possibly a lot of sentimental value for you or near your parents. There's also another way that you can own a property in that location is by going to the resale market. You still can get a PLH flat that is, I mean, the deemed PLH flat, because back then there's no PLH for, for those uh, matured locations. All right. And there is no 10 years um, and also the limitations of the income when you resell to the future buyer. Okay. So that's about the PLH. Any question on that? So Gabri, I, I, I pretty fast right, on this. Uh, well, well, the next topic, the next topic is an important one. Okay. So you can go. Keep going, keep oh, going. Yep. Keep going. Okay. Shall we use CPR for cash for your property investment? So yeah, most people may want to use. And then I'll share mine. Uh, okay. Go, go for it. Yeah. Okay. I'll go fast. Okay. CPF OA can be used for down payment, your monthly repayment, your stamp duty, and other legal costs. So mm -hmm. bear in mind, whatever CPF that is used to pay stamp duty and legal costs, and also uh, it's like paying other people, you know, it's not paying yourself, right? So if you are using CPF, all this money like looks like is cannot be recovered. If you, you, you want to recover it, you must sell at a higher price or even much higher price because the selling price would have to take into consideration of the accrued interest. So there's a rising trend of people not able to refund to their CPF after selling their homes. Do you know why? Because there is this accrued interest that is piling up over the years. And more people couldn't fulfill that repayment after selling their flats is because uh, there's a 2.5% accrued interest. Okay, and every year, if you talk about uh, this example, okay, if you withdraw 150,000 from your CPF, that interest is as much as 3,008 a year. So if you go over a period of, uh, you know, 10 years is 38,000 or more. So if it's 20 years, it's even more. So generally, property price growth is still higher than the current CPF rate in the past five years. Um, for example, private property price growth is about 4.8%, okay, over the last five years. And HDB growth over the last five years is 2.9%. Okay, but if you seriously want to uh, consider using CPF or not, there's three questions you need to ask yourself. Number one, are you super risk adverse on losing your CPF in property purchase? If you are, then don't use CPF, use cash. Number two is, do you need cash for some other purchase like renovation? So if you need cash, then you have to use your CPF. Okay, because you need to use cash to pay for renovation contractor, right? You cannot use your CPF to pay your renovation contractor, you know. So number three is, is the current mortgage rate lower or higher than CPF interest rate of 2.5%? Our current mortgage rate is still lower than 2.5%. So it, it is more attractive to take, to use cash or take maximum loan, all right, than use your CPF. So there is, there's a school of thought on this. So I would like to summary this. If you, if you want to use cash, you are someone that is risk adverse and would like to earn CPF risk-free 2.5% per annum. And if the mortgage rate is lower than 2.5%, okay, uh, then go for maximum, uh, maximum mortgage and at the same time, use cash. If you are using CPF, you need to use cash for other reasons. That's why you're using CPF. And the mortgage rate have, have rise and, and um, beyond 2.5%. Okay, so that, I hope that explains uh, whether you use cash or CPF. No, thanks a lot. Um, let me share my screen really quickly. So I think I, I completely agree with you, Marcus, on using um, on the pros and cons of using cash or CPF. So we actually put together this chart to explain this. So if you're using CPF, it frees up cash on hand for renovations, other expenses, obligations, and uh, something you did not touch on. You can, if you are using CPF, you might be able to afford a bigger down payment just because you might not have, you know, a huge amount of money. And, and to me, like in Dallas is about helping people invest better, manage their wealth better so they can live better and property and, and your condition, like where you live is, is a very important part of that. So, I, I'm not, even though in Dallas is the first digital advisor um, to, to help people invest their CPF better. And we'll talk more about some of those options in a minute. Uh, I still think that, you know, if you believe you can afford a larger property um, and you need to dip into your CPF savings for that down payment, it's not a bad thing to do so. 
Now the cons are the pitfall of the negative cash sale, which we just talked about and paying for that accrued interest. And you have less CPF money to prepare for your retirement adequacy through investment. So CPF is really your longest term money in your life. And you should be taking long-term risk and be compensated for that long-term risk and be doing that with your CPF money. So if you invest it, you cannot do that. And of course, on the flip side, the pros of using cash is that, yes, you can invest your CPF for that long-term investment returns. You can take on more fluctuation because if you can take on more volatility, more fluctuations with your investments, you can achieve a higher expected return. And that's what you can do with your CPF today, very simply online um, online within Dallas. Uh, number two is actually when you, when, when you, you know, there's no need to, to top up your CPF for resale. An interesting point about CPF as well, investing your CPF, is that if you do, and, and I, I, my, my hope is that you do not, but if you do have a poor investment decision, non-property, but uh, you know, um, in, the, in the market, so buying funds, um, buying stocks, if you have a poor investment, you do not actually have to pay that back to CPF with the accrued interest. So you don't have to pay back the loss with the accrued interest. Now, of course, the objective is not to put yourself in that situation, but it's just something to consider. Finally, um, the cons of using cash is that it reduces your liquid money, your liquid savings uh, for emergencies and other liabilities like renovations and things like that. So these are really the things to consider. And, you know, Marcus just talked about the interest rate and how that relates to CPF OA rate. I think you know, the interest rate has been low for such a long time that we forget that the CPF OA rate, which is set by the government, is actually dependent on the, in, the Singapore savings deposit rate and everything in the market is related. So if interest rates suddenly move up, the Singapore savings deposit rate will move up and that may push the government to increase the CPF OA's 2.5%, which is what it's been for a very long time. For those of you who have been tracking the market for a long time, you know, as early as nine, in the, the 1990s, the CPF OA rate was actually above 4%. Okay, so now we've been at 2.5% for a very long time. We're talking about OA, not SA or RA or MA. Okay, above 4% and tracking closely to the Singapore savings deposit rate over time. Now, if you were to invest that money, this is the exact same chart, but now on a different scale. I layer on top the returns of global stock markets. And rather than the chart being completely positive from zero to 5%, now we have a chart that ranges from negative 40 to 40%. And what I'm saying is that if you choose to invest your CPF, your longest term money, it is a very bumpy ride and you have to be patient and able to tolerate the risk involved. If someone were to invest $100,000 uh, back in you know not in two, 1990 and hold on to their investment through to June 2020 when we last ran this I mean it's it's going to be a huge difference now it, your invested capital would have had despite many many years of being underwater compared to CPF so for the first six seven years of, of making this investment you would have been kicking yourself and saying why did I make this investment your returns would be 400 over percent versus 135% if you had left your money in your CPF OA for the same period. But as you can see, you are taking on a lot of fluctuation. Um, within Dallas, we've created portfolios across the risk spectrum that you can invest with your CPF. Um, in 2021, for example, our very aggressive portfolio did over seven, which it did 17%. Whereas, and, and over an annualized period for the last 10 years, our portfolios have done anywhere from 3.1% for our 100% bond, very conservative portfolio to 12.6% annualized return or a 228% cumulative return over a 10 year period. Uh, if you were to be in CPF, you know, the compounding return of 2.5% uh, would have left you at about, if I'm, if my math is not wrong, around 30% return cumulatively over the same period. So you can invest your CPF, but you need to be taking on volatility and investing it properly. So that's not trying to time the market. It's not trying to time specific countries or specific stocks. 
It's by being broadly diversified and low cost in your approach. Okay, so the way we see it is as your duration of investment extends, your probability of success in beating the CPF OA rate increases. So if I invested in global stocks for 20 years, looking back, I never would have underperformed, even in the worst 20 year period, I never would have underperformed the CPF OA rate. And again, I don't mean investing in a handful of stocks that you select. I'm talking about investing in thousands of companies listed around the world in their stock. Marcus touched on this earlier about repayment of CPF accrued interest. And yes, the number of people, and, and it's, a, it's quite a sad story, but the number of people who have been failing to repay um, their CPF accrued interest has been increasing over time. Okay, so the unable to fully repay has been increasing over time. And this is just something to consider when you decide to use CPF for your, uh, for your property investment. So ultimately, should you use CPF or cash for property? It really depends. First thing you need to remember is that all of your money, your CPF, cash, if you have SRS, your SRS as well, is your money. They are all your money. You cannot think of them as, oh, that is that other pocket of money that isn't really my money. Your CPF is your money. Okay. Uh, you can actually, you don't have to choose between CPF or cash for the down payment. You can actually combine the two. So they're not mutually exclusive. And there are two things to note. I think your current cash flow requirements across, you know, all of the things you're doing. So from your, your mortgage requirements, your, your education requirements, your healthcare requirements, et cetera, and your ability to prepare for retirement. And CPF is an extremely important part of that um, where, you know, we believe that investing is maximizing your probability of success for your retirement. So uh, one, uh, one strategy that we've seen a lot of very sort of savvy younger people doing is yes, maybe they cannot afford the down payment entirely in cash, but as they continue to work and earn more income, as they invest and earn more passive income, they pay back their CPF and, and, and use their cash and CPF for long-term investment. Saving up for a property investments. I think, as Marcus mentioned, ultimately, we all need a place to live. And sometimes people are saying like, oh, you know, um, I want to buy this property and I'm going to sell it for a profit. I'm going to sell it at a higher price. But what you need to remember is that if you sell and you're trying to time the market, if you sell, you need to buy again. Otherwise, you won't own a property and you'll be paying rent forever. So most of the time you end up buying in at a higher price. So for example, if I bought at 900 PSF and I sold at 1500 PSF and I thought I made a great profit, I would need to buy in again. And ideally I don't want to downgrade my lifestyle. So I would need to buy in again at potentially an even higher price if I were to so-called profit on this trading of my own property which is what I've seen a lot of people do. And what ends up happening is a lot of people end up sitting out of the market for a very long time, renting, 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 and not being able to get back into the market. So it's not a very good strategy, if you ask me. I think you need to invest your savings while you own your property. If you're, if you're looking to upgrade or to buy a property, you need to invest your savings um, and make those long-term decisions, make those long-term planning decisions to really increase your wealth so that you can buy or upgrade your next property. Relying on your property alone is, uh, is, is not sufficient because that is a closed loop and you're, fa you're interfacing with the same market over and over again, which is the Singapore property market. So I hope, I hope that kind of makes sense to people. Uh, Marcus, do you have any comments on that? If not, I'll, I'll keep on moving because we have, we have more to, to get through. Okay. So when it comes to planning for your investments, it's really about understanding the types of liabilities you face and having the right investment plan to address each one. 
So if someone comes to me and says, hey, Greg, um, you know, I want to use my CPF to, in, to, to buy a property in three years time. I will tell them, well, that's fantastic, but you definitely should not invest your CPF then. Okay, so I'm not helping in Dallas in this, in, in that, you know, I want more people to invest their CPF. But if you're going to say, I'm going to use my CPF to buy a property in three years time, you do not want to be taking on that market risk, right? Where you could be underperforming the CPF, you could be underperforming CPF over such a short period of time. But if someone came to me and said, hey, you know, I want to invest my CPF for the long term for my retirement, or I'm looking to buy a property in 10 years time with my CPF, then I would say, okay, well, let's find an appropriate portfolio at the right level of risk that suits your goals. So in life, we have three types of general goals. We have cash flow goals, lump sum goals, so asset purchases, down payments, big gifts, cars, et cetera, and continuous goals. So that's like a rainy day fund or just generally accumulating wealth over the long term. And for each of these goals, you have different portfolios. Um, so you really need to think about your money in buckets. You know, you can have your cash management portfolio when you can earn, um, you know, higher than maybe the current fixed deposit, uh, anywhere from one to 2% uh, by taking on a lower level of risk, a very low level of risk. And that is determined by the types of securities that make up that portfolio. So fixed income, uh, fixed institutional fixed deposits, et cetera. And in Dallas, we have a structured, we have a structured portfolio for that called cash smart. Then you might say, okay, these are the things I need in the next two to five years. If you, if you need to do something in the next two to five years, again, I'm not going to go tell you to invest in 100% stocks where they could go down by 40, 50% at the blink of an eye as they do from time to time. And this is a huge global market, a market that is transacting over $500 billion a day. Okay, over $500 billion per day. And the market can fluctuate because stocks are more risky than bonds, full stop. If a company goes bankrupt, the bondholders get paid back before the stockholders. Stocks are more risky than bonds. So what I'm saying is you basically want to match all of these different goals you have with your CPF cash SRS to these particular portfolios at these set levels of risk. Now, this, is, this has been hard to do on your own. And seldom done. I mean, the way I see most people investing is they're like, oh, China looks attractive now. I'm going to go buy a China fund. Or US technology looks attractive. I'm going to go buy a US fund. And then being sold and sold these funds that are hot over and over again. This to us does not make sense. You need a much more systematic approach to your wealth for long term success. So, saving up for property investment, you need to invest for that property goal so you can grow your wealth beyond maybe your existing property, which you say, hey, look, you know, I bought this for 900 PSF and now the guy next to me sold it for 1500 PSF. Well, you can't sell that and upgrade if you haven't taken care of the rest of your wealth because you'll be buying into a higher market at 1500 PSF. So this is really like something that I think people need to understand and get over so that they can start planning longer term for in, you know, for the next for the, for really their goals and aspirations. Um, so it, take note of your investment time frame. Make sure you have you're investing the right amount for when you need that down payment at the right level of risk, right? So if you need that down payment in again, if you need that down payment in three years and you're going to use cash, we have a solution for that. I'm not going to tell you to go invest in 100% stocks and expect a 20% return every year like we did maybe the last year, because we cannot predict that future. No one can predict that future. So you need to be very, very reasonable and, and practical because this has real life implications to your lifestyle. And this is where, you know, when you think about diversifying beyond property, there, it, it, even in property investment, particularly in the world of investing and investing is so like investing and speculating is so accessible. Now there's like crypto platforms, fractional stock trading platforms, uh, you know, 
contract for different platforms. You can trade options. You can do all these different things. There is a ton of speculation out there and tons of people, that, you know, tons of news being pounded at you every day telling you to buy this or sell that. And it's very, very difficult to differentiate speculating and investment. So when you investment, we define as really for your for your goals. They can be short term, they can be long term, but they need, but you do not want to be taking active decisions in that investment. Speculating, yes, your friend said they made 100% on Tesla and you're, you feel very like you missed out on that. Like, and then you go buy some Tesla, that is speculating where single stock returns are random. St overall stock market returns, if you position yourself and you remain diversified and you remain patient, can really work for you. I love this chart. Um, I show it in almost all of my webinars where you can see as you increase in risk from short-term bonds to long-term bonds to large cap stocks to small cap stocks, the volatility, so the ups and downs increase, but actually the long-term return increases as well. You know, and, and the power of compounding is so enormous that if I had invested $1 in all the small companies in the US in 1926, and I use US data because, um, because uh, they have the longest, highest quality historical data, but similar picture for the rest of the world, a dollar would have become now, um, this chart needs to be updated over $40,000. So a million dollars would have become $40 billion. If I had just, I didn't pick any particular stock, I just continuously invested in small cap companies. Large cap companies, uh, you know, just a slight decrease in the annualized return of about 1.5%. From 11.7 to 10.3 percent annualized return, a dollar would have become eleven thousand dollars in that period, and that is the power of compounding. A one point, you know, a one point five, a one point five percent difference in the annualized return leads to an over 25 times difference in your total return, and the same goes down. So by not taking risk. And if you have a long investment horizon, like most of us do for CPF, you are really handicapping yourself massively and your wealth. So a lot of people say, okay, well, I can pick a particular market, but it's very, very difficult to pick a market or a sector or to say, I only want to buy real estate or whatever it is, because the returns fluctuate from year to year ginormously. And remember, a whole year is 365 days of reading the news and your friends telling you that they bought this and they sold that and, and they made this money and so on and so forth. And returns are random. I love this chart, which actually shows developed market returns over time. Singapore in 1999 had one of the highest returns at 99%, followed by third lowest at negative 37, sorry, at negative uh, 27% the following year. And it fluctuates enormously. So even picking a, a market is very, very difficult. Very similar for emerging markets. So you really need to remain diversified and not try to time the market. Um, we run this example of the worst market timer in the world. So someone who only invests in the market before it goes down by 20% or more. And for this person, because of this ridiculous power of compounding and by taking the compensated risk of owning the companies of the world. So these are the companies of the world who are trying to make a profit, who are trying to create shareholder value every day. A $500,000 investment only at the worst times possible since 1970 would, have, would, would be at $8 million today. And that is the power of compounding and being invested versus not. So again, Structure your money in buckets for long-term success. Um, within Dallas, you know, there are a number of solutions here that, that, um, that are across the risk spectrum that you can buy off the rack uh, based on a few questions. And we will help you be diversified into thousands, in some cases, tens of thousands of securities 
around the world at a low cost in best in class funds. Again, um, you know, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, for a very, very limited time as a part of our partnership launch with ERA, you can get $20, $28 off your Endowless access fees, which is equivalent to $10,000 for um, advised free for eight months. So scan the QR code, check us out. It's completely free to, uh, to start your Endowless account. And I'll really quickly switch over to some Q&A. I tried to address a few of the questions in my speech, in my talk just now. Um, maybe we can change to just Marcus and me on the screen, which would be great. Thank you. Okay. Um, there was a question about interest rates. So would interest rates increasing, Marcus, uh, what would that do to the property market? There's an expectation that interest rates will increase. Yeah, uh, I can take on this because I also asked this question to mortgage advisory rate break. Uh, my good friend uh, in rate breaks, his name is Eugene. Eugene Huan, which is the CEO of rate breaks, uh, have actually answered this. Most of the people out there that took mortgage have already refinanced their positions into fixed interest rate. So they have hatched against any uh, sudden surge in um, interest rate. So uh, existing homeowners uh, like you guys that are tuning in right now, if you have not refinanced, I think you should. And you should approach um, financial advisory such as Rate Break to do this work. All right. <laughs> I'm doing a favor for my friend. Rate yeah, Break. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, but uh, having said that, I feel that if you are buying property right now, okay, uh, Singapore interest rate uh, is still very attractive. It is still below 2%, okay? So currently, it's like a, uh, something like between 1.1 to 1.3%. So uh, residential interest rate is, is always lower than uh, commercial interest rate, okay? So uh, there is still that spread between the yield and the interest, and that is your margin. Okay, so uh, earlier on, Gregory talked about that yield for properties like low, okay, something like uh, two to three percent, or if you are buying at a much higher quantum properties, like landed properties or luxury properties, probably even lower than two percent. Mm -hmm. So uh, you may not look at the interest rate as uh, investment uh, consideration for cash flow. It is more for capital gain. Okay, but for those who are more critical on that cash flow, then you have to, I mean, TDS are actually take care of that because TDS look at interest rate as 3.5%. Okay, let me say that, that means affordability being taken care, financial prudency have to come in. Okay, which means if you still need to buy a property, uh, the, the risk is there if there is an interest rate increase, if you max out your, uh, <laughs> the way you buy, um, invest in property, then there's a chance that if you lose your job, uh, there will be a mortgagee problem. So I think uh, you have to be very careful uh, when you do your purchase in a rising interest rate environment. Okay, so um, together with the mortgage advisory, you also should uh, engage a trusted advisor in uh, property, such as our, our ERA trusted advisor. Okay, okay I hope that cool. answered that question. Yeah, just a few more questions. I know we're way over time here, but we still have like uh, quite a number of people watching this live. Um, okay, do properties with shorter leases lose their value faster compared to properties with longer leases? And related to that, related to that, um, what property maintains its value best over time? HDB resale, 99999 freehold landed what what is your house view i think this that? perception uh gregory i think this more on perception uh, is like forever means best uh. freehold means best triple nine if you can leave the three, triple nine then it's best uh. otherwise it's, it's deemed like a freehold so i would say that uh for perception reasons it's always better to go for that freehold or, tri or triple nine but if you look at it on the uh, if, if you were to draw the numbers and then you compare freehold and 99, if you look at the investment point of view, uh, the 99 years leasehold properties that is new development, 
It means we're having their lease reset at 99 years. Yeah. Um, proved to be better than freehold property. Okay. Over for the resale of, as well. Uh, for the new homes. For the new homes. For the new homes. For the so, new homes. So if okay. you buy a new home, a new project that starts at 99 years, all right, uh, over a period of at least three years, that will fulfill the SSD uh, uh, this uh, period of three years. So if you if you were to sell their property after three years, uh, from what we what we have tracked is that the percentage of growth uh, compared to if you buy a freehold new development, all right, it's always better to go for the ninety nine years because the purchase price, the entry price is lower than freehold property. So you know freehold, but perception is better. The seller will be selling at a higher price or so. So for resale property, as the lease decreases, okay, obviously the values may not, uh, the, the rate of growth uh, may have been kept because of that reducing risk, but because high tide rise or ship, if the property market is, uh, is uh, it's hot, even if you are on a leasehold property that is short lease, your price is also up. Okay, but the rate of growth is slower than freehold property over a longer period. So it's always wise to uh, consider if you are going for resale property. If you have a choice, uh, you, you have to pay a higher price for that freehold. Maybe you can yeah. consider going for it. All right. Awesome. So I hope that answered the question. And, and so, but if it's yeah. HDB flats, okay, yeah. HDB flats. Recently, uh, I visited some of my agents that stays in the HDB flats uh, and I delivered some of the awards to them during the COVID-19 period. And I, and I tell you, I'm so impressed by that HDB flats upgrading. And it looks like condominium, especially those in Marine Parade. <laughs> and they have sea view. And uh, the, the development looks like condo. What I'm trying to say is that in all development of HDB flats, you know what the government do? It's called upgrading. So that flats become like new. But if you mm. go to an old development of condominium, it depends on the MCST, right? And the resident there will probably do not want to renovate or rather they want to go for on-block sales. So there is still appreciation in capital value if the condominiums, the old condominiums is successfully undergone uh, collective sales. Okay, so doesn't mean that a depreciating leasehold property will have no values. There's still potential values for on-block sales, which will, which will also provide a big uh, asset. Uh, this uh, growth for all the homeowners. But for HDB, there's no, I mean, it's not on-block sales. Uh, if it's on the SaaS, you will be able to uh, be given that uh, new flats, okay, in another location, another similar location. Otherwise, is because of all the upgradings of the old flats, the old flats will also keep its value. Mm -hmm. Okay, so far, I don't think we have reached a zero leasehold for HDB flat yet. Yet to be it proven. Will, it will come. It will come at some point. I mean, it's just probably a when, of um, years. Probably yeah. when I'm not around. <laughs> no longer around. <laughs> There's like probably another 40 or 50 years later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think again, it okay, for for investment purposes, I, I definitely have seen freehold hold up better than leasehold over a longer period of time. Um, you know, we've seen and but I think it's important actually to consider what you are trying to achieve with your property investment. So if I want a bigger property, a bigger home, and I'm going to live there, right? I'm getting value out of that. I'm getting dividends out of being in a bigger home, living there in a prime location and paying a much lower cost on a property that might have like 55 years left on the lease versus mm -hmm. a freehold or a new launch next door. So I think there's something to be said about, you know, not always considering the oh i'm gonna make money on this property but actually thinking about the total value for your life that you get out of the property right right, right. Um, actually yeah. if it's talking about investment if you're renting out a freehold or a leasehold it doesn't make any difference to the tenant so yeah <laughs> the tenant will so not for, rent for you know, of the yeah. first tenure but for yeah. you uh, a leasehold property will probably be more attractive because for the purchase price correct. is lower yes yeah but for capital well, appreciation, the, the free amount. yeah. But for capital appreciation, the freehold would probably be more attractive over a longer period of time. Over a uh, longer period of time. 
So like talk about 30 years, right? If I, if I bought a leasehold that was 80 years and held it until it was 50 years versus a freehold for 30 years, it's, it's a different thing. Um, but then again, like if I'm upgrading and I buy a leasehold with 50 years left, I could get it at a much lower PSF, much higher quality perhaps than the freehold or the new launch next door in terms of size and everything else. So I've seen that happening more and more. And I've seen friends sort of make that choice because, you know, it, it, it will pay dividends for their lifestyle, which is also very important when you're considering a home for yourself. Um, and I'm going to end it right there because we've just crossed 830 and I know you're hungry. Uh, so thank you so much, Marcus, for joining us today. Um, and, uh, and thank you everyone for tuning in. I hope this session was helpful in letting, giving you information to make you know, educated decisions about property purchases and investment purchases. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much for everyone's attention uh, to Gregory, to all the, uh, the teams in Endowers Access. And I also want to uh, invite all the uh, guests here. If you have further questions or any other questions, could you sound out our trusted advisors from ERA? We are most happy to answer all your inquiries. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much.